Uh, welcome uh, to today's show. My name is Glenn Deason. I'm a professor at the University of Southeastern Norway. And today is the 2nd of June, and I am joined by none other than Colonel Douglas McGregor. Uh, welcome, Colonel. It's uh, yeah, great to see you again. Thanks. Good to see you as well. So uh, there's really a, a lot to talk about uh, since the last time I spoke with you. There's been a lot of changes. Uh, most importantly, uh, Russia re recently uh, captured uh, Bakhmut, which has been, uh, I would say, the main battle of this war. Uh, in the media, first they presented the Battle of Bakhmut as being decisive. Uh, yet once it became evident it would be lost, it was suddenly well demoted to a mere symbolic town. So, uh, so I, I, that's why I wanted to ask you: uh, What is the significance of Bakhmut, uh, both the fight for Bakhmut as well as uh, holding the city, and why did they fight so hard for it, uh, both sides? <clears throat> well, I think it's it's useful to point out that certainly starting in, I would say, uh, late November, early December, given uh, Zelensky's clear obsession with this city of Bakhmut in Ukraine, uh, that Sorovikin, uh, the general who has commanded most of the operations in the theater, made the decision to turn Bakhmut into a kind of Stalingrad and exploit the opportunity to kill as many Ukrainian troops as possible. Remember, the purpose of the operation from the very beginning was to destroy or kill the Ukrainian army. I mean, this is the whole business of denazification. You want to destroy the armed force on your border that threatens your country, and that's what the intervention is all about. It has never been about the conquest of Ukraine, per se, but the destruction of the enemy. So the enemy was very obliging and poured tens of thousands of troops in relentlessly. We think that at least 50,000 Ukrainian troops were killed, at least that many or more wounded. So the operation from a Russian standpoint has been brilliantly successful. And the more we look at Ukraine right now, given the public announcements of an imminent Ukrainian counterattack, the more we question whether or not the Ukrainians have the wherewithal to even conduct such a thing. Because the losses they've taken over the last year are so desperately bad, uh, it's hard to imagine them putting much together that's going to help. And remember that in addition to just Bakhmut, all the activities on the other side to feed troops into Bakhmut were also under careful observation and were un under attack. That includes assembly areas, ammunition storage areas, communications, transportation, and so forth. Now, all of this was done while the Russians assimilated the 300 thousand reservists and 80,000 additional volunteers into the mainstream Russian army. So that's been going on relentlessly for months, and I think they're now paused uh, for the next phase. And I, I think they'll wait for some period of time to see whether or not the Ukrainians actually put together a, an attack. Some people are saying, oh, the Ukrainians are already doing that. Well, if that's what they're doing, these are more pinpricks that have absolutely no impact whatsoever strategically on, on the Russians. And that includes things like the uh, drone strikes on Moscow. You know, you had some number, I don't know, it was 19 or 20, uh, all but three were shot down. And then the other, the three that did fall to the ground were active. In other words, they had explosive warheads, but they don't seem to have had much left in them in terms of fuel or range. But the, these things are pinpricks. They don't change the strategic uh, outlook whatsoever. So if the if I'm right, uh, and I think thus far I've been right, the Ukrainians may try something once that's exhausted, whatever it is, and I think the Russians will move and try to finish as much of the job of destroying remaining Ukrainian forces as they can. Well, yeah, no, I can appreciate that this has mostly been uh, well, given that there's, there can't be any peaceful negotiation, or at least this has been rejected. That this has become. Uh, primarily a war of attrition in terms of exhausting the adversary. But uh, uh, but I was wondering, uh, given the amount of uh, uh, military strength the Ukrainians have lost uh, in Bakhmut, uh, do you expect to see any Russian offensive coming? Because we heard all this about the Ukrainian spring offensive, which, which never came, given well, spring is over. Uh, but do you see Russia moving forward? Because uh, over the past few days, you know, I've seen few movements towards uh, Dvorichna, Kupiansk, you know, Avdika, Marinka. But do you think, uh, do you expect a huge offensive or will Russia just continue to well, slowly grind on? 
I think what you're seeing happen is an extension of something else that the Russians have approached incrementally, and that is to expand beyond the, the lines of defense. Right now, 20 to 25 kilometers in front of the main defensive belt uh, is what we call a security zone. Now, the, the advantage of a security zone is that when your enemy tries to penetrate it, move through it in order to reach the defensive line, he's subject to very accurate standoff attack from missiles, rockets, or conventional artillery fire. He also runs into minefields and things like this. This has been devastating for the Ukrainians, obviously. Now, the Russians control this 25-kilometer strip uh, all along the front, and I think they're expanding it. And if you look at the map, just pull it out and look at the places where they are expanding, look at the road nets and the rail lines that are connected to them. It's not difficult to establish that if you control most of these areas that they're interested in right now, then moving your forces forward to advance becomes much easier. In other words, you're not fighting your way through massive Ukrainian defensives. You're simply putting large numbers of vehicles and equipment and soldiers on multiple routes and moving them forward to attack positions. And I think that's what we're going to see in June, now that we're in June. Now, when, I don't know. And again, I still think the predisposition on the Russian side is to wait a little longer because the Ukrainians have now announced that what was formerly going to be a spring offensive will be a summer offensive. And the Ukrainians have taken uh, steps to create a force that can attack. Now, that force consists primarily of the thirty to 35,000 Ukrainian soldiers training in Britain, the United States, Canada, the Czech Republic, and Germany, and, and moving them back to Ukraine, where they can become the foundation for this counterattack force. Now, to these could be added another forty or 50,000, but I suspect that the forty or 50,000 are not nearly as well-trained if they're trained at all. So once that's assembled, and that's a force of what, somewhere between 50 and 60,000 perhaps, they will try to launch at a particular point in the line. Now, they'll probably create diversionary attacks elsewhere, but they'll try to find a point of weakness. I, I don't think it's going to work, and I think whatever they do, they're going to be devastated once again by the Russians. Because if there's one thing the Russians have learned how to do, it's maintain persistent surveillance. People don't bring this up. But the Russians have, for the most part, the same kinds of technologies that we do in space, as well as uh, on board unmanned or manned aircraft, which means they, they have a, a clear picture every day of Ukraine. Now, they're going to focus, obviously, on the areas that are in eastern Ukraine beyond the Dnieper River and some of the areas to the west, but they can see the whole area. And very recently, you had a an attack by the Russians near Kiev uh, of uh, this uh, Ukrainian secret police, or not secret police, but uh, military intelligence headquarters. And I guess it was a Kinshaw missile or an Iskander tactical ballistic missile because it had a, at least a thousand pound warhead on it. And it was uh, very accurate, very precise, and killed lots of people, not just the ones who were in the building, but actually penetrated into the bunker beneath. Now, this was a signal to the Ukrainians by the Russians, that we know where everyone is, because Putin has been talking about decision-making centers. You know, he said, where are the decision-making centers? He said, well, we know where they are, and we've been talking about attacking them. <clears throat> Once again, indicating that I think that Putin has approached this carefully, cautiously, and incrementally, because he has not wanted to provoke Western intervention in Western Ukraine. So instead of uh, taking out a sledgehammer and smashing instantly, he's taken out multiple smaller hammers. And it's had the same effect of killing Ukrainian forces. But this was a message that he was sending saying, look, we know where you are and we'll hit all these places. And by the way, the Russians are not running out of missiles. <laughs> it's all nonsense. So the Ukrainians are in for a tough time and he would like to negotiate an end to this thing. He's made that clear from the beginning. But there's been no willingness in the West, particularly in Washington and London, to talk. <coughs> so I think, <laughs> excuse me, at least for the moment, I wouldn't expect any dramatic change until the Ukrainians either launch something or demonstrate they've got nothing left. One of those two things will happen. Once that's behind them, then I think the Russians will move. But they will move not as you would have seen uh, in 1941 or 1940 with the Wehrmacht 
because warfare has changed. They're going to move forward very cautiously, very deliberately, because they want that intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance bubble over their forces so that as they move and they encounter any serious resistance, they can bring it under almost immediate standoff attack. And that attack will include everything from mortars all the way up to tactical ballistic missiles. And that's how they're going to minimize casualties, and that's how they're going to succeed in utterly destroying the Ukrainian force. So in a sense, the Russian forces become a magnet for the Ukrainians. The closer you get to the Russian forces, the more likely you are to be utterly destroyed. It's that simple. Well, I was wondering, though, has the Russians changed any? It's, to what extent they've changed their weapons or tactics or strategy? I, I see there's a lot of consistency, but uh, from the reports I've been seeing and videos as well uh, con confirming it, uh, we see that, uh, well, every day the Russians appear to be attacking and blowing up a weapons depot in Ukraine, deep, deep inside Ukraine or across its entire territory. So I was wondering... Uh, what is the state of Ukraine's air defenses? Uh, is this what is enabling the Russians to to target everything in Ukraine suddenly now, or or is this merely more? Or are these reports accurate that uh, something significant has happened? Well, Ukrainian air and missile defense, starting back at the end of November, beginning of December, with Sorovikin's targeting strategy, uh, has been largely annihilated. Their, what they have left are point defense systems, such as the Patriot systems that we saw taken under fire and destroyed recently. They can't defend an area very well, but they can defend a, a certain area, in other words, a point target on the ground. Those systems are in, in high demand and very, very short supply. And this is also being of interest to the Russians, because if you could eliminate that air defense, then you, you can actually employ air power more liberally, which I think is also beginning to happen, especially if you go down near Zaporizhia, you look at that open area, that's a great place for Russian uh, close air support when the time comes. They've already used some of it. And that's because there's increasingly no air defense to speak of. But again, you know, Putin is being careful about that, has, has, uh, have his generals. And I think what he's trying to do, what they want to do, is strip away as much of that as possible, whatever is still remains, they want to make sure that any attempt to resupply and sustain the forces east of the Dnieper becomes a nightmare. Because if you're striking all of these targets in the West that have military significance, warehouses, supply houses, transportation systems, you want to annihilate as, that as much as possible. Then you go after all the command and control, which he referred to as decision-making centers. Eventually, you have a, a fragmented, atomized force in front of you which is then slim pickings, as we say in, in American English, for the advancing uh, armored forces that are gathered down in southern Ukraine. So I, I think what people have trouble understanding the, the way the Russians look at this, the Russians are not operating to our timetable. They're not trying to outperform Guderian's advances across eastern uh, Ukraine. They're, they're trying to achieve an objective, which is to utterly destroy the force on the ground and to compel people to talk to them, to negotiate with them. And if not, then they'll destroy them. So that's where we are. And I think they will make good use of the next three, four months while the ground is fairly solid and dry to advance. And their goals are very clear that other than eastern Ukraine, where they are now, they have an interest in Kharkov and Odessa because these are historically Russian cities. Uh, they are not going to turn those over to the Ukrainians. You know, you can go back to 2014 and earlier and look at the atrocities committed against Russians down in Odessa. There should be no question in anybody's mind that Odessa will once again be Russian, as will Kharkov. But other than that, the Russians have no desire to rule Ukrainians. I mean, they know that the Ukrainians in the West uh, are absolutely incurably hostile to them. They don't want to rule them. They don't want to govern them. They just want them to be neutral. In other words, they don't want Ukraine exploited by NATO and the United States uh, as a potential battering ram in the future, the way it was exploited over the last eight or nine years in eastern Ukraine. They don't want to wake up and find missiles in their backyard that are pointed at them, at all the key targets in, in Russia, any more than we wanted to wake up and see missiles in Cuba pointed at everything in the United States. It's not very different. But we didn't want to rule Cuba. We didn't want to govern the place. 
We just wanted to get the missiles out. I think the Russians feel very much the same way. Now, if we refuse, and everybody keeps saying, well, what if, what if, what if? If they can't get a settlement out of the Europeans that guarantees the neutrality of whatever remains of Ukraine, then I think you have to face a very real possibility that the Russians will do what Prigozhin was talking about quite recently. And Prigozhin said, we need to mobilize. We need two million men in uniform and finish this war once and for all. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen, because then I'm absolutely positive you will see Russian forces on the Polish border, the Romanian border, and on the Moldovan border. There's no doubt about it. But that's not that's not necessarily the agenda. That is the inevitable outcome of our failure to talk, our unwillingness to consider legitimate Russian security interests in the region. That's all. Well, I was thinking if if there is going to be any negotiations, uh, it looks as if the the weak spot would be the well, the, not the weak spot necessarily, but the ones who would be eager to talk is the are the Europeans, uh, because uh, well, I guess the Europeans are suffering more in this war than than the, the United States. Uh, but do you see anything coming? Uh, any willingness to talk? I know that uh, uh, well, you spoke about the. Uh, Ukraine needing needing to go on the offensive and uh, well it seems that uh, based on the statements of certain leaders that Ukraine must deliver some results in terms of territory or destruction of uh, Russian military before the NATO summit in Vilnius otherwise uh, the support may start to drop um, do you think uh, the Europeans might be more willing to sit down and actually talk and find a compromise uh, if there aren't any uh, well, any summer offensive by the Ukrainians over the next month? Well, Glenn, if you were sitting in Moscow, knowing that this little group was meeting in Vilnius in Lithuania, just across the border from Belarusia and Ukraine, what would you do? I think that if I were in Moscow, I would unleash all holy hell. In other words, I'd go ahead and crush whatever remains of the Ukrainians in eastern Ukraine as decisively as possible. I would make life inside Ukraine worse than it's ever been. Now, while I was doing that, I would also look carefully at the people in Vilnius and see if there's any evidence for sobriety and common sense. Now, Schultz is in a lot of trouble in Germany. We talk about him a lot. Germany has now moved into a very deep recession. But things there aren't bad enough yet. In other words, when the Germans can't buy food on the shelf, when the Germans can't put fuel in their tanks, when the Germans no longer have electricity when they need it, then the Germans will become seriously upset. I think Schultz will be gone and everything will change in Germany. And if it changes in Germany, that's it. Europe changes because Germany is the powerhouse. It's the foundation for the EU's scientific industrial power. At the same time, you have Mr. Macron sitting in Paris. With each passing day, he seems to be doing more and more and more to express his discontent with the conduct of the war in Ukraine and, and seems to be trying to tell the electorate that uh, he's really on their side in France. And Mr. Macron is widely hated and despised. I'm frankly surprised he's still in office. So those are the two states I would watch most carefully, Germany and France. And the situation for the government in France is probably worse than it is or much worse than it is for the German government in Berlin. But they're both tense. And if I were a Russian, I would look at that. But I would not waste too much time waiting for something to happen immediately. I would go ahead and use the opportunity to wipe out as much of the remaining Ukrainian forces that exist on the east side. But then I'm speaking as an American, not a Russian. And I, the Russians have a different way of looking at these things, and they may have a different agenda. We don't know. But no one should doubt the capability of the Russian forces on the ground in Western Russia and Ukraine to do this. They can definitely do it. Remember, they still have over 100,000 troops sitting up in Belarusia uh, facing uh, the summit. They're not interested in using them at this point. Would they do so in the future? It's hard to tell. That, that may be part of the security guarantee against Western intervention in Western Ukraine, that then the forces can come down out of uh, Belarusia and help to crush whatever comes across the border. That's a possibility. On the other hand, it may be one of these things where once everything's rolled up in the east and the Ukrainians begin to cross the Dnieper at uh, Dnieper-Petrovsk and head south to Odessa, for instance, 
then we may see some movement up there to cover the flank and secure uh, Russian interests there. I, I don't know. All of those things are possible. And all of these questions, I'm sure, are on the minds of General Gerasimov, General Surovikin, and obviously President Putin and his Minister of Defense, Ge Mr. Sh uh, General Sh Defense Minister, I guess, Shoigu. But we don't know the answers to those. And it's hard to know what the Russians expect or what they perceive. But I think that's kind of where we're headed. How soon we get there is anybody's guess. Okay, so Russia is likely then to step up the pressure over the next four weeks. Uh, but um, the Ukrainians have to kind of deliver on a, an offensive as well before this summit. But but what are the capabilities though on the Ukrainian side? I mean, you have, um, I'm not sure how well you're high ranking in the U.S. Army. I'm guessing you you have some sense of uh, whether or not NATO itself is running out of ammunition and weapons or what, what, what do we have left to send? And do the Ukrainians have any uh, production capabilities of their own? Well, they do have modest production capabilities, but nothing to compare with the Russians. The Russians have massive military industrial factories. They're churning out weapons and equipment 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They've got brand new equipment now they did not have a year ago or over a year ago. In other words, the, the force on the ground that we face today in Ukraine is infinitely stronger and more capable and lethal than what existed in January of 2022. We've done that. We've induced the Russians to, to make those investments and expand. The Ukrainians don't have much. Now, when we say much, what does much mean? How effective can a force be when it consists of German, Czech, Dutch, Lithuanian, British, French equipment? And if you go back and look at the Second World War, one of the key lessons that all of, we in the West tended to learn from the experience of the Germans in the East was the criticality of minimizing the diversity of equipment. In other words, use as many of the same engines as you can. <clears throat> In other words, simplify the uh, resupply of forces and repair parts and the logistical infrastructure. At one point, if you go back and look at someone like General Balk's memoirs, he talks about seven different vehicles with seven different engines and seven different uh, supply and uh, repair part infrastructure requirements on the Eastern Front in his divisional formation. And he only at that point had a division of perhaps nine or 10,000. And it was a nightmare to keep all of these different systems running because you never had enough to service everything. Well, this is the Ukrainian position now. They have too many different pieces of equipment. How do you keep them all running? And there's a tendency now to use it. If it breaks down, dump it go get another something, replace it, and move on. That's very difficult to do over time. It's going to become more difficult when the Russians are breathing down your neck. Remember that the Russians have been defending largely. In other words, they ceded the operational initiative, in a sense, to the Ukrainians by allowing them to organize, mobilize, assemble, and attack. Well, the Ukrainians haven't got much left to do that with. I told you what I think they have left and what they might be able to do. But then you have the equipment nightmare, the resupply nightmare. And these nightmares aren't getting any better. Whereas on the Russian side, the situation is infinitely better now. They've moved forward large caches of equipment and ammunition. Things are positioned where they, they can be rapidly pushed forward and, and resupply their troops. The Koreans don't have any of that going on right now. So I, I, I feel badly in the sense that I think there are probably people in Washington and London who are saying, now, listen here, Mr. Zelensky, you need to demonstrate that you're real and you've got to put forward this effort or we're not going to be able to support you. I'm sure some of that's going on right now. But if you're a European watching this debacle, at some point you must say, good Lord, how many people are we willing to sacrifice? How many more Ukrainians have to die? How many more millions of refugees are we going to have to deal with in Europe? These are all legitimate questions. At some point, the pressure to end this and return to normalcy will be very great in Berlin and Paris. Remember, the British, like the Americans, sit on islands remote from the scene of the action. That's the problem. We have always been remote. And when things don't go our way, what do we do, Glenn? We sail or fly away because we don't live there. Remember, it goes back to Charles de Gaulle, kept saying people in, this, in the continent need to understand. The Americans don't live in Europe and England is, a, is an island. <laughs> I mean, come on, wake up. 
Uh, they don't share the same fate as the continental Europeans. But uh, I was curious about this new weapons, nonetheless, because you mentioned the British. I think they've been uh, yeah, very much in, in the lead of uh, of these escalations. I mean, they're the ones who were pushing heavy for tanks. They were now they sent this uh, the ammunition with depleted uranium, um, and of course, these new long distance weapons. Uh, do you see any of this as a, being a big game changer? Something that can uh, give the Ukrainians significant advance? Uh, sorry, I get a significant advantage. Uh, we keep talking about, you know, turning the tide, and uh, uh, which is kind of a contradiction in terms, because we keep saying that Ukrainians are winning, they're winning, yet we have to turn the tide. So there's uh, yeah, some faults in the narrative, obviously. But do you see any of these weapons being something that can make a decisive difference? Well, you recall the enormous uh, detonations and explosions we witnessed near Helmitsky in western Ukraine where you had large numbers of these uh, storm shadow missiles and DU rounds uh, stored for eventual disposition and use on the front. Uh, again, as I pointed out earlier, the, the Russians know where these caches are. They know where the supplies are, and they have been systematically destroying them. So even though you may get 20, 30, 40 storm shadow missiles, how many of those are ever going to reach the front? Now, I don't know what the number is that has actually gotten there. I do know that they fired some, and I do know that a small number, one, two, or three, have actually made it through integrated air defenses on the Russian side and hit some targets down south. Is that going to make a difference? Three missiles? In other words, if you had a 1,000 missiles at your disposal with which you could attack in support of your ground forces, which were thoroughly organized, trained, and equipped with predictable sets of equipment after predictable you know, periods of long-term training, then I would say you had a shot at, at doing some real damage and making a difference. That doesn't exist. Those, those conditions don't exist. So the big answer to your question is no. Uh, if you can pinpoint a target in Krematorsk or a target uh, outside of Dnipro, or a target uh, anywhere else in Ukraine that you think harbors equipment, weapons, troops with impunity, and that's what the Russians could do right now, how far can you really expect the Ukrainians to get? I don't think very far. And uh, well, I also wanted to ask you about uh, how, how you see NATO being impacted by this war, because uh, there's a lot of official uh, statements, obviously, both by yeah, the officials, uh, but also in the media, or the, the main argument that, uh, you know, NATO is getting stronger, they're more unified than ever. And uh, obviously the concerns of Russia certainly becomes a source of solidarity. But on the other hand, I also hear people like uh, Lawrence uh, Wilkerson, who was uh, a retired U.S. colonel and also uh, yeah, chief of staff for Colin Powell, who argues that uh, the Europeans are becoming uh, more, uh, well, uh, apprehensive uh, about you know the u.s uh not uh you know, well, well contributing to provoke this war but also not wanting to make any negotiations and well continuing with the british of course to escalate but uh, more importantly wilkerson pointed out that uh what he saw was that the europeans were uh, becoming the major economic victim in in this war and uh well besides from ukraine obviously uh who suffer more you know humanitarian level but uh uh, but for this reason, as the Europeans now are weakened and become uh, excessively dependent on the U.S., he argues that there's a lot of resentment uh, you know, uh, coming up from the surface. Uh, then uh, obviously Macron being the the, the key example of uh, of um, yeah this new pushback. But uh, so he he actually questions whether or not NATO will be able to survive if this war drags on. Do you see it in a similar way, or how, how do you see NATO coming out of this war? Uh, on or about 9 or 10 January, uh, I was invited to participate in a discussion on this topic. Uh, there were several questions. The one was, and this was at the Center for the National Interest, which has since gone out of existence. Dimitri Symes uh, was the uh, moderator for the discussion. And at the time, they said, well, will the Russians go in? I said, absolutely. Everybody else said, well, it's unclear. We'll have to see. No, I don't think so. They'll never risk it, blah, blah, blah. Then the next question was, well, what's the impact on NATO? And I said, then 
that I did not think the North Atlantic Treaty Organization would survive the war. It's very simple. You have 30 plus nations. Most of them have interests that other nations within the alliance don't share. Each, if you look, if you stand in Rome or Athens or Sofia, uh, you have a different strategic picture from the people that live in Berlin, Oslo, uh, or uh, Amsterdam. You don't see the world the same way. You don't see the same world if you're in Paris. In other words, where you where you sit has a big impact on on your view of things. Secondly, if we had brought this war to a rapid close, say we'd interrupted uh, the operations at the end of February and beginning of March and say, wait a minute, that's enough. We, we have to arrange peace talks. Let's have a ceasefire. We'll host it. And Ukrainians and Russians will work this out and we will be supportive of whatever, you know, the two sides can, can reach in terms of a, an agreement. We didn't do that. And so now the opportunity for that kind of thing is really very, very weak. Uh, so I think that inside Europe, once you get past the facade, you go behind uh, the facade of unity, uh, there's extreme concern, extreme concern about what will happen. You know, the, you have the Norwegians, for instance, who are very interested in having the United States help protect their interests in, in the North Atlantic and protect their border with Russia up on the Arctic Circle. What do you do if at the end of this whole thing, if the continental Europeans say, well, we've had enough? The only thing the Americans have done is drag us into a destructive war that we didn't need to fight against a country that really wasn't our enemy, contrary to the popular belief and the and the standard narrative and propaganda. Uh, that's when you're going to see things break down. And I think that's coming. I think it's already being discussed behind the scenes, but it's going to break out into the open. You've already had comments uh, slipping out from the French, from Macron and others to suggest this. And again, if you're in Southern Europe, you see the world as one one way. If you're in Western, another. If you're in Central East, another. It's very hard to hold a large alliance like that together in peacetime, peacetime, let alone in war. Uh, so I I don't have I don't have any faith at all that this thing called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization will survive this entire crisis. I'd be very surprised if it did. How about uh, the ability to? Well, you mentioned that we should have. Uh, try to find a peace or or end this war once it broke out in in February of last year. But uh, uh, well, given that we're here now in June of 2023 and uh, yeah, the war is still raging on and we appear to be losing, uh, is there any possibility of reaching a peace? I mean, uh, from both sides, both from NATO or NATO and Ukraine, but also Russia on the other sides, because from the Russian perspective, they've uh, I, well, from what, what I hear talking to Russians, uh, their main thought would be. Uh, well, well, why why would they trust us again? Because uh, look at the Minsk agreement. Uh, the the main assumption would be we would merely, uh, yeah, ag agree to a ceasefire and use this time to rearm Ukraine and then fight another day, uh, yeah, much like the Minsk agreement. But uh, also, you hear similar arguments on NATO side, NATO side, that we can't have a ceasefire with Russia because this will allow Russia to rearm, regroup, and then fight another day. So we appear to have the same argument. The, the commonality, I guess, is zero trust in the opponent. So given that this is the case, uh, even if we want peace, is there any possibility at all to sit down and uh, you'll agree to anything? Well, well keep in mind that, uh, as I pointed out earlier, the Russian military in January, February 2022 was much smaller not nearly as well armed and their goals and objectives at the beginning of this thing were actually quite modest. Uh, we changed that by trying to drag them deeper and deeper into conflict, thinking that if we could pull them into conflict, they would wear out, they would fail, they would collapse. And we continue to hear this nonsense all the time. Oh, Russian morale is terrible. Russian troops aren't any good. Generals are incompetent. Equipment's no good on them. It's all nonsense. It's exactly the opposite. All of those things can be said about the Ukrainians. So right now, the real question is, if you're in the driver's seat, why would you want an end to the war if you're sitting in Moscow? Well, because the, the Russians really didn't want a war to begin with. What they'd like to have is a good business environment. But we've destroyed that for them in the West. We've tried to use our financial system to destroy them. We've tried to harm them in any way we could with our sanctions. None of it's worked. 
And so you have something else happening right now in St. Petersburg in June. And that I don't know if that's going to coincide with the Vilnius meeting for NATO, but I think they're going to be pretty close. And in St. Petersburg, you're going to have over 84 nations talking about how they can go to a new gold-backed currency system and begin trading with each other internally on the basis of a gold standard. And of course, the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, the Saudis, and others have amassed enormous quantities of gold. So they can do business that way. We're not in the same position. In the meantime, we increasingly don't have the kind of support from the rest of the world that the Russians and the Chinese do. We made ourselves pretty unpopular over the years. So how do we get an end to this thing? Uh, we have to we have to say something we don't want to say. Let's talk without preconditions. Number one, no preconditions. And hear, hear what the Russians say. Remember, the Russians sent us several proposals. We wouldn't even consider them. This is back in December and January of 2022. We just dismissed them out of hand. So we haven't listened. Are we prepared to listen now? And as you're pointing out, you don't think so. But I think the Europeans, if they change the heads of government, at least in key states, and they change the nature of the people that they send to negotiate, I think there's a chance for something good to happen. But if you pick someone like this woman, Baerbock, this foreign minister who behaves like a uh, an American teenager in high school uh, trying to demonstrate for some silly cause in 1969, you're not going to get anywhere. I mean, if I were Lavrov, I wouldn't take her seriously. I wouldn't pay any attention to anything the woman said. So you've got you to get rid of these people and then send somebody who's serious. I mean, everybody took Helmut Schmidt seriously. Everybody took Cole seriously. I mean, th these men had stature. They had experience. They had credibility. Now, Gerhard Schröder was a bit of a disappointment, but he didn't change too much. But the real problem we had was with Merkel, who, as you point out, turns out to have been part of the big lie at Minsk. So she and anybody associated with her is going to, you know, raise real questions in Russian minds. But I think the Russians would like to see this go away. By the way, cheap energy is absolutely vital to the success of any civilization. Civilizations are built on it. People talk about human slavery. Slavery was cheap energy. That's how great civilizations began. And the point is, we've got to go back to it. Now, how do we get cheap energy? In the United States, we've destroyed the energy sector. And what by that, I mean that the, the big firms that, that build the refineries and extract the oil and the petroleum and everything else and the natural gas, they're not extracting beyond what they've already got because they see no incentive to do so. You have a similar problem right now in Europe. The Germans just shut down the last nuclear power plant. And somebody said, well, we have to do that for climate change. Well, I, I don't even want to waste time on that subject. But let's assume that your, your concerns about climate change are figuring prominently. Do you destroy everything that you have before you have a, a viable alternative? Do you really think you're going to live on windmills? You know, it's sort of nonsense. There was no thinking which is extremely un-German, by the way. I would have thought that the Germans would have said, look, we, we share these goals. However, we cannot reach X, Y, and Z given current circumstances or we put our economy at risk, we put our standard of living at risk, we put people's jobs at risk. Well, all of that caution was thrown through the window. So when do we get new governments? People that are rational and sober and recognize that things can be done, but not as rapidly as they'd hoped and not as radically as apparently they've supported. I, I think Putin is going to wait a certain amount of time, uh, but then he's not going to wait forever. And if he has to move all the way to the Polish border, he'll do it. I don't think anybody should question that. And I don't see any evidence. Maybe you do, Glenn, but I don't see any evidence for anybody in Norway, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, France, mobilizing their countries for war do you no the the war all the suffering uh, human suffering from the war is obviously on the ukrainian and russian side uh, in this war uh, primarily ukraine but uh, but i thought it was interesting the the economic aspect because this appears to be what uh, what, what, what will break the europeans you mentioned this uh, the the meeting now in St. Petersburg. This is the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. What's interesting with this was when it set up, it was 
because it's in St. Petersburg, which is the European city of uh, Russia, it was meant to attract uh, European investment, to integrate Russia into Europe and have this greater Europe. Um, it's on yeah from the 14th to the 17th of June. Actually, I'm presenting on a couple of panels there this year. But uh, well, what is interesting is um, now this year, it will almost, because of the absence of the West, it will uh, almost be a... Uh, event for the opposite of what was intended now it's to connect closer with uh, countries in the east so uh, that's what i don't think many people appreciate uh, in europe either that uh, older industries uh, technologies uh, currency uh, all transportation uh, everything's being decoupled at the moment and uh, it's uh, it's going to be uh, yeah a lot of economic losses which can't be regained uh, lost status here but that's uh but I was wondering if if uh, the U.S. and Europeans aren't feeling the the military pain as we're not on the front line dying, but because the Ukrainians are dying for us, uh, do do you see any concerns? Uh, you know, being your presence in Washington, do you see any? Uh, well, knowing Washington, at least, do you, is there any concern there about the economics? Not just the dollar, of course, taking some punishment, but uh, the the general geoeconomic infrastructure of the world shifting away. Is this something that can uh, incentivize uh, Washington to talk to Russia, or is it all about what's happening on the battlefield? Well, if the majority of people in Washington on the Hill, that is in the Senate, the House, as well as in the government, were rational, I would say yes, but they're not. Remember, they look through this lens that was formed by them in the 1990s. They look through this lens that tells them that Russia is weak and backward and corrupt and can be bullied. It's just a matter of time. That's their view. They look at themselves and they think that we are the power we were in 1991. You know, when I deployed to the Persian Gulf in 1990, we had 5,000 fighters in the air that we could put against the, the opposition, the opponent. Uh, we still had uh, just a little less than 800,000 men in the United States Army. So we could field 300,000 troops on the ground. We had no opponent at sea at all, a Navy with nothing to do but transport our forces and uh, equipment and ammunition. Well, all of that's gone. We're not the same nation. We don't have those forces any longer. We'd be lucky to have 500 to 1,000 fighter aircraft, even with our lives. Uh, I think there is a, a failure to understand reality in, in Washington, D.C. The only way that we're going to get any change here is for things to get much worse economically. I think they're headed that way, but not as quickly as they are in Germany and on the continent of Europe. It's, it's going to get worse there faster. That's why I think there's a chance for change in Europe before there's any change here. Remember, we're still stuck with the same government, uh, at least in theory, until, what, January 20th, 2025. They can continue to do a lot of damage and make more bad decisions. Decisions like the ones that have ruined our energy sector, decisions that have harmed our agriculture, decisions that have harmed our manufacturing. Th this is going to continue. Look at the open borders. You know, conceivably, we could face a situation where we're dealing with fifth column elements inside our own country uh, inflicting damage on us. What kinds of forces do we have to put against them? You know, this is this is the problem. We're we're just not realistic in appraising ourselves. And when you go to war, which is what we chose to do uh, when we built up Ukraine, we we were planning this war for a long time, and we were convinced that we would beat them. You know, using the Ukrainian forces with our backup, that hasn't worked, but we still think it's possible. We're hoping against hope. There's an unwillingness to see reality. And I think it's going to come back to haunt us in, in major ways. I don't know if your viewing audience is aware, but we're now seeing anti-tank weapons and more sophisticated gear that we have provided to the Ukrainians show up in the possession of the drug cartels in Mexico. They're walking around with these weapons that they've purchased ostensibly through intermediaries from Ukraine. This is not a good sign. And we do have a hostile neighbor on our southern border. We pretend that he's not hostile, but it is because it's organized crime. You have an organized crime state on our border. This is a very serious problem. 
And Americans are going to have to come to terms with it. If something erupts there, everyone here will forget instantly about anything happening in Eastern Europe. And most Americans are not paying attention to what's happening in Eastern Europe. We're not allowing them to know that Americans have been killed or wounded in Ukraine. And they have, but no one's announced it. No one will tell the truth about it. And Americans just sort of listen to the news, say, oh, well, you know, I guess, uh, I guess these Ukrainians are going to really destroy these Russians, just give them a couple of more weeks, and this will all be over. Look, the Russians are on their last legs. That's what people think. That's all they hear. I mean, I'm sure you've heard the same thing in Europe. It's not true. Yeah, we just had a poll come out in this country saying that the majority thinks uh, Ukraine is winning, so that's the media. Anyways, I... I uh... I will uh, let, let you go as uh, you, we run out of time. But I just wanted to thank you again for your time, Colonel. Uh, it's always sure. a great, great pleasure. So thanks again. Thank you. Goodbye, Glenn. Bye.